Welcome everyone to uh, the Aperio Lightning Talks. Um, this is sponsored by the Aperio Farm Group, which is the funding and resource management. And Aperio Farm um, is a grassroots effort for us to support each other in launching enhancements to existing Sakai, excuse me, existing Aperio projects, of which Sakai is, is one of them. And I was going to make a joke that, you know, today's, today's uh, um, recording is sponsored by Aperio Farm uh, Buttermilk Biscuits. I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the Prairie Home Companion. <laughs> so we could have a little jingle. I haven't come up with a jingle, though. Uh, I'll have to come up with one for next time. And in front of you, you see on the slide uh, there is a really nice visualization uh, that was created for us by Julia uh, Forsyth at Brock University. And it kind of shows the basics of what the farm process is about. And if you have an idea, there's different ways of getting your idea out there. This is one of those ways, the lightning talks. You can chat with the farm committee. There's a Perio newsletter. There's lots of ways to get your idea out there. There's voting. Um, there's, and then there's different ways of sharing your project. And uh, you know, the hope is that projects that get a lot of momentum will then turn into resource projects that have people and money to make them to make them happen so i uh, just thought i'd put a pitch in for that um and uh, welcome everyone here and we're going to start off we have four presentations today and we're going to the format will be uh to do one presentation for five minutes we'll time it for five minutes then we'll take five minutes for q a and then we'll move on to the next one we're going to try and be pretty tight on time although um, we have a little bit of wiggle room today uh since we have four presentations and four times 10 minutes a piece is, is 40. Uh, but why don't we go ahead and get going and let me bring up matt i'm going to bring up your slides and if you wouldn't mind introducing both yourself and your topic and i can also hand the presenter permissions over to you let me get this up first let's see here we go and let me find you on the list All right, Matt, you're up, and I'm going to start timing. Are you ready, Matt? I am ready. Can you guys see my screen? You can see the selling Sakai, yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to share some slides with you guys, but I'm not going to do that because that'll cut into my time too much. So I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. And for the next five minutes, I'm going to talk just very briefly about a presentation that I originally gave at Open Aperio this spring, uh, which was about selling Sakai, so why you should do it and how to get started. The second half of that presentation that I gave at Open Aperio included some examples of how we have been selling Sakai at UVA. For time constraints, I'm not going to share those examples with you today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the framework of how we got started selling Sakai and a little bit about branding in general. And then if you guys are interested and want to dive in and learn a little bit more about this and see some of the examples of what we've done, I can share some of that stuff with you. In fact, I'd be delighted to do that. So I want to talk just briefly about what branding is, how we develop a brand for Sakai, because that's what we're really talking about here. And a lot of people think that a brand is just what their product is. But really what a brand is, is what your audience thinks of uh, when they think of your name. It's everything that the public thinks that it knows about you. So if there are some folks from Illinois State on the call, we were joking a little bit about this at Open Aperio because one of the things that they did when they wanted to get into branding and communications was they searched Twitter for ReggieNet, which is the name of their instance of Sakai. They wanted to find out what kind of presence they might have on social media. And the only thing that came up for ReggieNet was, is ReggieNet down? And that's obviously not what anybody wants to think of when they think of their open source product. So, you know, that's the kind of thing uh, that we want to avoid. You know, we don't want a brand of being down, even if that's not actually the case. 
And so when we think about branding, we also think about the fact that you know brands outlive individual products because they are what people think about when they think about that brand. Uh, Tricia, I know that there are no slides, um, and that's because I didn't want to cut into my time. I'm just going to talk for the next couple minutes, and then um, if people have questions or if we want to dive into more visuals, I can share those with them. So no problem about that. Um, anyway, branding is something that is very important. It's deeper than just a product because it's what people think about when they think about our product, the kinds of adjectives that come to mind when they think about us. And when UVA started diving into that, um, UVA started um, by following the larger branding and communications plan that had been developed by the university as a whole when they started working with an agency based in Philadelphia called 160 over 90. And I see that Laura is already mentioning some of these adjectives in the chat, easy, fun, useful, efficient. That's exactly right. You know, these are the kinds of things that we want people to think of when they think about Sakai. These are the things that we want to be the building blocks for our brand. And so for UVA in their larger university branding campaign, they came up with what they call a positioning statement, um, which is something that they use as an internal idea that encompasses the essence of that brand. And the positioning statement that UVA came up with for the entire university was something called living idealism. And that was designed to combine two essential concepts that people felt were really important for the university life, uh, something more practical, and idealism, which is something that's more aspirational. And they thought about putting those two things together to combine something practical and something aspirational to encompass what UVA was. And then in order to support that positioning statement, that general idea, they came up with some things that they called brand pillars. They're the ways in which your brand supports that ideal in the positioning statement. And they came up with four of those, uh, four ways in which UVA supports that larger ideal. Uh, a perpetual state of ingenuity, a uh, commitment to achieve at the highest level, a sense of shared ownership, and a promotion of the public good. These four big ideas that supported that overall larger concept of what UVA was all about. And then they moved to those adjectives, those adjectives that Laura was just talking about uh, that come out of the brand pillars supporting that positioning statement. You know, ideas like being adaptable, being collaborative, being energetic, being innovative. And those are the kinds of words that I used to build our stuff that we have used for our communications for our instance of Sakai, which is called UVA Collab. So I'd be delighted to hear more comments, questions from you guys, and I'd be delighted to share some of the examples of the work that we have done. And I look forward to continuing the conversation about how we can sell Sakai more and sell it better. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so now we're going to open it up for five minutes of questions. So uh, Didi wrote, heck yeah, please share. And Laura Sierra is contributing to the betterment of community, big pillar for Notre Dame, big pillar for Sakai. So Matt, who did you involve in these um, brainstorming conversations? So that's a great question, Laura. Um, I'm so glad that you asked that because one of the things that we were able to do when we got started was work with our university's communications department um, as I mentioned, when we got started, we started to piggyback on some of the communications efforts that UVA was already doing. So UVA has a fairly large communications office that includes a website that has all kinds of marketing materials and branding materials that different university groups can use in order to make all of our communications across the university a little bit more uniform. And so we were able to use a lot of that. And if you have something like that at your institution, I would definitely encourage you to dive in and do that, um, to reach out to your communications people, and at the very least, you know, offer to help them do their job uh, by doing some of the marketing for them when it comes to your product. And also, just an FYI in response to what Didi said, I put a link in the chat to a PDF of the larger presentation that I gave at Open Aperio, 
which will include um, all of the materials that I use there. I'll also give you a link to the promotional video that I made that was similar uh, to the stuff that Kyle has been doing um, that I put out about a year ago. Cool. I imagine you can uh, you can see in the chat the other questions that are coming in, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I see a question here from Terry about how you get buy-in to shared ownership. Um, if you're referring to the open source community in general, Terry, I think that's actually one of the strongest selling points for Sakai. Uh, the fact that when you participate in it, you are part of a community of leading, in many cases, cutting edge, top ranked higher education institutions that are working together to create a product that is going to take higher ed into the 21st century. And oh, I think that's a exactly. huge selling point. Go ahead. Jay. That's not exactly what I was talking about. Um, as, as an instructional designer, I know that it's hard to get faculty to buy into the idea of shared ownership, that they're not the only ones who have um, some kind of input or management uh, over the course. And I was wondering, you know, how or if you were able to get that kind of big cultural change or the idea that, that faculty is a participant in the course building, but not, not the, the only one. Well, in this way, I would say that what you guys are doing at Johnson and what we are doing at UVA is slightly different, uh, which again is one of the testaments to the flexibility of Sakai, that it's my understanding that at Johnson, the IDs have a significant role in how each and every course looks and works in Sakai. And actually at UVA, it's largely the opposite, uh, that what we want to emphasize is that instructors have a lot of flexibility in how they use different tools and create their sites for their purposes. And that's actually one of the things that we like to emphasize to them, that they have a lot of control. It's not really the same sense of shared ownership that you guys have that we have. Stop here. clicking. Oh, sorry, I forgot my mic was on. <laughs> But thanks for that question, Terry, because I think that also highlights something um, that we like to talk about within the Sakai community and outside the Sakai community, that there are a lot of different people at different institutions using it in a lot of different ways, which is that kind of flexibility that everybody is talking about when they talk about the next generation digital learning environment. And let me see what else we might have here in the chat. I see there's a lot of stuff moving quickly uh, from Dave. Does UVA do any evaluation of the use of the LMS, uh, but not for change to another LMS? That's a great question, Dave. That's something that we are definitely thinking about doing in a more substantive way. Uh, we, you know, do some evaluation and get some statistics uh, such as adoption rates, uh, voluntary adoption rates for faculty that we use. But we would like to do a little bit more of that. And now that UVA has a contract with Qualtrics, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, we're really looking forward to doing some more evaluation and gathering some more of that data. And I see from Dave, the survey idea is, you know, what we are doing well, absolutely. Um, what we are doing well and also some things uh, that we can do even better, but absolutely what we are doing well. Uh, and Trisha's noted, you know, UVA, we have a Twitter account to help promote Sakai and other people that we follow. Uh, Twitter is definitely something that's included in the larger presentation, and I would encourage you guys to check that out. Um, social media is something that we have been trying to do more of, in particular this year, so in particular over the last six to eight months. Um, I would recommend uh, producing a lot of original content on your social media feeds and producing a good quantity of content. The more regularly you share relevant content with your users, the more they're going to engage with you and follow you. I think, Matt, if I can interject, I also think that um, when you retweet what others are doing at our university especially, um, it encourages more um, buy-in and uh, a sense of shared ownership. Absolutely, absolutely. And go ahead, Neil, whenever you're ready, just seize okay. control. 
Yeah. All right. So yeah, we're a little over time, but thank you. We have a couple minutes to spare in the in the session. So thank you, Matt. Uh, generated a lot. It looked like a lot of curiosity and interest. So um, thank you for that. Um, all right. So the next up, if you don't mind, would be Jolie. And I will bring up your slides and then give you uh, presenter permissions. Let's see. Here we go. And there's your slides coming up, I hope. There we go. And let me give you presenter permissions. All right. OK. Start Ready? whenever you feel like. Yeah, okay, anytime. Great. <laughs> OK. Um, hi, I'm Jolie Tingen. I'm at Duke University. And I was billed today to talk about the Sakai UI inventory project. Um, you'll see my slide here says um, that it's about creating a style guide. That's because um, the UI inventory project is just one step in a, a, a process of a much larger project. Um, so I'm going to talk about the inventory project, then I'm going to talk about style guides first, and then the overall goal of the project, um, which is to cre create greater consistency throughout Sakai's user interface. So most of you know what style guides look like um, because institutions use them all the time for their basic branding, for um, what their icons should look like, which what their um, their logos should look like, what typefaces should look like, and standard colors. And um, application style guides include the same thing, but they often contain a lot more than that because there's code involved. And this is just one example of a, of a nice style guide that's um, through the US government. And I, we use this example because it has, it addresses different audiences. It ad addresses des designers and developers, and also has a whole section on accessibility, which I think is fantastic. So this is, this is the direction that we're going. This is what we want is an updated style guide for Sakai. Um, Sean Foster and I, who's Sean Foster at Western University, presented at the Aperio conference, and he dug this up. This is the last complete style guide we were able to find from style from um, Sakai 1.2. So it's pretty old. Um, and back then, Sakai looked like this. This is a screenshot I was able to dig up from a presentation from um, a conference long ago. And today, Sakai looks like this, which is pretty different. And I think many of you who've been in the community for a while, especially if you've been in for the past, let's say, five years or so, um, will agree that a lot has happened with Sakai's user interface even within the past three years. There was a big jump with 11 um, with, the, with the Morpheus skin and responsive design and a lot of the work that NYU has done. And what we haven't done is done a good job of documenting that so that people who want to do new work in Sakai have something they can refer to. So that's our goal. And we're doing that through um, a process that's based in at atom um, atomic design. We're working with Duke Web Services, which is in OIT at Duke University, um, with our department, which is the Center for Instructional Technology. We're working with the community to um, start the process of creating a new style guide. And one of the steps um, that's in the atomic design methodology is to do a UI inventory. And um, my colleague Barbara Puccio and Duke Web Services and I sat down and sort of sussed this out months ago about how we would approach this in the community. And we're doing it through this, um, this spreadsheet style where people can go and sign up. And then there's a link to inventory documents. And people are doing screen cap captures of those documents, um, of those tools to um, sort of capture the UI across the application. And that's just another example there to the right of what that looks like. Um, and we're actually capturing both the student and instructor perspective of what the UI looks like in each tool. And then the goal is, once it's done, is to, Barb my colleague Barbara will pull together the inventory from all the tools. So every, every um, inventory, like say, for instance, for all the tools that have buttons, and the buttons have been captured for those tools will be combined together so we can see the buttons across the whole application. We don't have that yet, but this is what it looks like from um, Brad Frost's website where he has, he, Brad Frost is the, uh, the person who developed Atomic Design. 
um, he inventoried his bank's website. And so you can see this discrepancies across um, the whole application. Um, and so that's the goal is that once we have something like this, once we have these collated together, um, we'll be able to start a conversation about what we want, you know, what kind of decisions we need to make with the design for Sakai and what kind of discrepancies exist and, and what we want the consistency to be and start developing a style guide. And I said this would um, be part of an overall project, and this is something that Sean Foster has called making the switch. And switch stands for standardization within tools can happen. And so you'll see that the inventory is just one step. It's the step that gets us started to understand what our application looks like. Um, you know, what are the discrepancies out there? We can we will be able to see it across the entire application. Start having a conversation about a style guide start defining that, iterating on that. And then once we have a style guide, actually come up with a new farm project that says, hey, we need to make these consistencies across the application. We need developers and designers to do that. So that's it. That's the project. Thank you, Jolie. Uh, now it's time for questions. And I'm sure, Jolie, you can see things uh, flying by on the chat screen. Yes. Let me see if I can back up a little bit. Um, yeah, 2005. Um, Confluence page for project info. Yes, there is a Confluence page um, for the project. Um, I thought I had a slide in here at the end that had some linked resources, but I'll be happy to paste that in. Um, I just, I don't have it up in another tab right now. Ah, awesome. Somebody, somebody does. Thank you. Thank you, Wilma. Um, Anything else? Did someone else ask something? Oh, Adam Marshall, it would be good to make all UI components use Bootstrap. I have no idea how easy this would be. I don't know either, Adam. Um, this is part of the reason I kind of looped um, my colleague, Sean Foster, um, in because I, I realized that once we come up with a style guide, we've got some great folks here at Duke to um, help us with that in terms of both UX and, and, and visual designers, um, graphic designers, there's a whole technical element that will have to happen afterward and that will involve a lot of Sakai specific um, expertise. How is the process going? Are there still many tools that need to be adopted for the, in for the inventory? I was just looking at it today and my colleague Ben at Illinois State University has really been knocking it out of the park. <laughs> if you've looked at the spreadsheet recently, he's done a lot of work. Um, I've seen some comments that he's made this morning on sheets I haven't even had a chance to look at. Um, and they started back in, in June. Um, um, I got an email while, right before I went on vacation saying that they had a student, they, they wanted to work on this, but I, I think it's Ben, it's his name that's on the sheet. And, um, and I said, yeah, let's just get started because I knew that 12 QA was happening now and I wanted, I didn't want our inventory to conflict with those resources because August, September, okay, it's kind of a tight time for folks. So I thought it would be great to get started early. One thing, this is Terry Golightly, one thing that we found at LAMP, and I'm speaking because it's kind of complicated, that we found at LAMP is that we end up operating as a microcosm of um, of a large Sakai community and the law of un unintended consequences happens all the time. The buttons and the setup that we currently have when we try to put individual school skins on, all of a sudden different schools have different consequences to changes that were supposed to make everything easier and smoother. To get to the question is, how how are those complications being considered? Because across, everybody's going to impose their own skin requirements and their color schemes and all this kind of stuff on all of this universal appearance kind of thing. And um, what is the process going forward for making sure that everybody comes out happy? Ooh. Yes, consistency. So, you know, I, I don't understand technically what's happening there when you apply your difference. You have a shared environment, right? We have a shared environment with 
20 plus different institutions at, with different skins and different colors and different parameters for all kinds of things. And it goes way, way deep in, you know, the, the tiniest little color on the tiniest little feature might look really good with this skin sheet, style sheet, but really come out odd with another one. And, um, and it's just hard to make it work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, Terry, I know one, this is Laura, I know one of the issues you're talking about, and uh, this will probably jog Jolie's memory too. I remember, I think it is um, like a question or a checkbox box in lessons where the color of the background of that box is derived from a color picked elsewhere. It's like 50% opacity or something like that. And that's exactly the sort of thing that 50% opacity of one specific color may look good on that skin, but of a different color, that 50% opacity doesn't look good. So I'm sure that um, towards consistency, we'll have to define um, the parameters differently, right? So the values can have more control to them. That's just one thing I was thinking of. Yeah, and so that you, when you say you're talking about the color on that button, that you're not affecting the color on some other thing somewhere else. It's just kind of a spider web of things and you pull on one and it, and it just has almost, I think we're in the quantum universe when it comes to these things, you know? <laughs> I, think I, know I think I know what you're both talking about. I mean, I think there's, there's a, probably a code aspect, a code management aspect to this um, and, pro and maybe a design aspect to this as well. I think these should definitely be, um, these should definitely come up when we're talking about the style guide and we should be prepared to try to find these specific examples and track down in the code what, you know, where that's happening so we can understand how we need to remedy that if we're going to make these changes. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah. It's good to bring into the conversation. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Okay. Uh, we probably need to wrap up. I see there's some additional uh, comments and questions in there, uh, but to fairness of time, uh, we'll move on if that's okay. Thank you, Jolie. You're welcome. All right, next up is Laura Geckler, and I'm going to bring up your slides, Laura, and then give you presenter permission. So just hold on a second here. Let's see. You're the redistributed grade scale, right? Nope, not that one. There's a PDF. No. Okay, different PDF. So gradebook plus feature. Yeah. And it needs to go back to the beginning slide. Oh, I'll, no, I'll we've that. got a preview. Oh, that's uh -oh. terrible. I was going to amaze and confound everyone. Let's see. Well, here, let me give you uh, presenter permissions here. Uh, where are you? Where am I? Oh, I see you're at the top, right? OK. Here you go. And whenever you want to start. Well, today I want to talk about a Sakai gradebook feature that uh, Notre Dame has been working on. We've been proposing an enhancement to an existing Aperio project, but that can take many forms. You can talk it up, you can vote it up, you can write a JIRA, you can put it on the farm site and vote it up there, you can hire a development, a developer for the project, you can have in-house developers write the enhancement. So anyway, the project I used for this new gradebook distribution chart process that I used is only one of many that you could use. So uh, whatever process you use, I came up with five here, but I didn't give it a lot of thought. It's just as simple as wash, rinse, repeat with maybe a couple more steps, right? Wash, rinse, repeat. So as Lucy says to Charlie Brown, these five fingers, individually they are nothing but united, they form a fighting force, terrible to behold. Ta-da. Yeah, uh, they do. That's the power of Aperio. Um, I love being a part of this group. We have around 20 individual software projects and communities all learning from each other the best ways to collaborate and get stuff done. And that's what we're doing here, right? Collaborating and getting stuff done. 
So in my case, the first step I followed was meeting with the first with the two profs here locally who'd been asking for about a year for a gradebook two enhancement. And one was from the dean of a new program, and one was from my then boss who was going to work with that dean. So one wanted a feature to have a type anything column in the gradebook and don't include it in calculations and let me do my own thing. The other wanted to remind faculty what grade points uh, equate to what letter grades, and then to help faculty meet departmental fair grading guidelines across sections, which means that every section of a course site needs a top uh, course grade point average of 3.4. Make it fair across sections. And it wasn't until I got them in the same room that I realized they were both aiming for the same thing. One of them was a techie, and he was going to roll his own through Excel and then just upload and the final grade, right? And then the other one wanted a broader user solution where Sakai lifted the load. So either way, this is what I mocked up. I started writing use cases, and some of the work was easy, like um, place the grade point letter grade conversion directly in front of faculty when they're creating their grade point schema. So that was done. It's just a label. Or allow the grade display choice for students to be independent of what faculty see. And I think that was actually finished in the original, this is the next gen grade book, of course, um, so that a student can see the 88%, but not see that that equates to, a, in this case, that would be an A minus um, from your screen. Or they could see it in terms of points, right? 183 over of 200 as their course grade. But the instructor would still see the translation is to a B based on their grade type. So um, in this additional work, we wanted a distribution chart. And we wanted um, instructors to be able to alter that schema at any time of the semester to see how their students are doing in terms of those grade points without the student display actually reflecting those changes. So the minimum viable product of this particular enhancement turned out um, that we needed to release was calculate and display the course grade point average, which is just a simple calculation we already have in our data dictionary here at Notre Dame. You add the grade points and multiply it by the number of students eligible for the grades in that particular course. And so that way we came up with um, we came up with this, uh, going back to those fingers on the hand, um, in my case, even step one and step two were kind of iterative there. We, and then step three, we hired Steve Swinsberg, and I kept refining the requirements at the same time. And as Steve asked more questions, I would go back to my local requesters and subsequently to the community. And this one right here is specifically sticky. We had a lot of community input on um, over the, the project's listserv. It was how to display the distribution based on the changing labels on the X, Y axes. So right here you see on Y we have the number of students and on X we have, uh-oh, that's my own timer, but Neil's gonna tell me I've almost got time here. Anyway, what we ended up from here is that. That's not going to work. So we're going to go back to, and this is where I want to select this. We're gonna go back to something like this. So this is in the code base in trunk right now, and I will stop there and you can ask questions. Thank you, Laura. Any questions? Hey, Laura. Uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Tricia, and um, I'm, you said something that I, I didn't quite get, and so this is a screen where faculty can go in and tweak the minimums, is that right, to, right. to um, see how that affects the distribution? That is correct. And <clears throat> so, but that is not evident to students. Depending on how you set up your um, uh, setting above in the next in the grade book, it says what grade you're displaying to your students. Uh -huh. The assumption is you're not displaying the letter grade. Right. 
Right. That is the assumption. Right. But it's going to, so, so they're doing this after the fact and they're changing. And I, I don't understand, I guess I don't understand what the goal is here. <laughs> Especially if students have seen their grades already and then the instructor goes in and manipulates them in some way. He well, hasn't seen this. The student has seen the number of points out of how many, or the student has seen the percentage, but they don't know what the letter grade equivalent is. Oh, because that's not in the syllabus already, as it should be? In this particular case, it isn't. Oh. But uh, most instructors do put that in their syllabus, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, in the Mendoza College of Business, in order for the large number of sections, which have limited enrollment in each one um, of each of a particular course, they need to make the grading fair from section to section. And so they have set a 3.4 grade point average for the course grade. And you can see the course average GPI, GPA on this screen. <clears throat> and in fact, you can see, um, let me see, I've got a, another slide. Let's see if it's this one. Oh, nope, sorry, it's not that one how you might adjust this because that looks kind of corny doesn't it i mean well it does because it's all fake data but they redistributed so now they have a different this letter grade is the only thing that changes the students still get the percent they got or the number of points they got uh, so it inhibits grade book inflation yeah, I can I can see your use case, but I don't think it's the only use case. That's my issue with it. Yes, I would like to collect more use cases. Well, the use case I'm thinking about is that in a syllabus, uh, percentages are translated to a letter grade often. And therefore, manipulating the... Um, minimum percentages after the fact. I think that could be confusing. It will be. It will be if you publish if you publish that an A is going to be between these percentages. These these instructors aren't going to publish that. But you're proposing that this go into gradebook as a feature for everyone. And I'm concerned that it's going to cause problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be misused by some faculty who don't understand it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well, that's feedback that I need to pay attention to, and I appreciate it. Um, as everything, uh, when we do these kind of things for Sakai, we need to realize that we need to build it so that the most number of institutions benefit from it and that it can be configurable and turned yeah. off and turned on. Yes, another I was just going to say that. So yeah. yeah, and another thing I just realized, Tricia, um, talking last week with some folks from Europe is that grading systems don't even, uh, aren't even the same, right? Grades yeah. or scales or marks from around the world should be able to be configured into a grade book. And then the last thing that I want to keep in mind as we move forward this is that the code has to be easily modified for the next change because it's going to be changed again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I think we're about up on time on, on that one. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> so the next up is uh, Trisha. Let me go ahead and load up your slides and and give you presenter permissions. Let's see. So which one is yours, Trish? Uh, I forget the name. Do you remember uh, the name of your not roster? So it has roster. Oh, the in roster. It. Right, yeah. right. There it is. And UVA. And UVA is in it as a nice clue. Too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Couldn't remember. Uh, uh, yeah. Let me give uh, you permissions for presenting. Thank you. There you go, and anytime you want to start. All right, thank you, Neil. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Tricia Gordon at the University of Virginia, 
And I've also invited Matthew Hall on our team to join us in case there are questions because he did all of the development work on the enhancements that we have made to the roster tool. Um, so when we upgraded from 2.9 to 10.2 a couple of years back, um, we discovered the changes that were made to the roster tool. And, and what you're seeing right now is what's currently on Nightly 2. So this reflects pretty much what um, the changes were. And um, bye, Dave. So what you see here is an overview tab um, with a spreadsheet-like view of the list of people in the roster, including the instructors. And uh, unfortunately, there does appear to be some overlap of a couple of columns. I think we noticed this as well and may fix those in our initial um, release uh, when we did our upgrade. There's also an add connection option that has a hook into the profile tool, which we removed. Um, we found that the connection profile stuff didn't really work that well and wasn't used widely here anyway. So we thought it probably would be better for us to remove that. <clears throat> so um, we got a lot of pushback from our faculty about the roster tool change that, that occurred from 2.9 to 10. And we decided we would add or make some enhancements. And so one of the first things that Matthew did for us was to create a few different views. Um, and this was all based on feedback. Initially, we thought this card view would um, satisfy most of the requests that we were getting to restore some of the um, functionality that was in the roster be before. And so Matthew came up with this beautiful card view. Um, we really liked it. It still has all the nice filtering options, um, being able to switch from official to um, profile pictures, etc. And uh, had all the information about groups and contact information as well as well as official photos, some of which you can see here from some of our usual suspects here at UVA. Um, we also wanted to keep the spreadsheet view. So um, as I mentioned, we did remove the connections. For the email address, we just, um, we didn't post the email address because um, for the most part, the user ID is the first part of our um, email addresses here at UVA, so that should suffice for, for most cases, and just clicking on email then launches your um, email client to send email to that student anyway. Uh, we also added an option to hide photos in this view. So um, those are some of the changes that we made, and we're calling it spreadsheet view instead of overview. And finally, we um, got some additional feedback. We thought between the card view and the spreadsheet view that would satisfy most of the issues uh, that were being reported by faculty, but quite a few also then said we, they really wanted that photo grid view, view back. And uh, so <laughs> Matthew uh, was able to recreate that and, um, you know, most a lot of faculty here like to print this view and take that with them to class as a way of learning names of their students. So, um, so we decided that was a good view. Now for each of these views, if you click the print tab, which we made a tab, um, it prints that view. So that's also very nice. And the export uh, exports the usual, you know, kind of spreadsheet minimal information. Uh, so those are the enhancements that we made. And I'm going to ch now just go to the chat and see what we are. All right. So love the card view. Thank you, Louisa. Is that the default when roster loads? Yes, it is. And Laura wants to know, are roster photo permissions configurable for the instance? In other words, can photos be turned off for students? So we have photos turned off for 
uh, they're all, well, I should say this. Official photos are only turned on for instructors of record in our CIS. So we have implemented that business rule so that um, TAs, anybody who's actually added to the roster in our CIS can view student photos. Um, students cannot see any photos at all. So great question, Laura. Thank you. Photos are, uh, no, they are not. But you can print the photos. And Louisa says, also great for instructor to remember, exactly, remember students' faces. Yeah, exactly. So one of our questions for the community is, are these features that other schools using Sakai would like to have in our core Sakai? And if so, um, we are interested in contributing this back to the community. Um, we have some funds. We're going to hire a uh, developer in the community to help us contribute this back to make, you know, to get our patches into the next release. I guess we're too late for 12, but um, so I guess these would be added to 13 uh, when, and if, when and if that um, branch is released. So great. Um, so then if um, it sounds like most people think these would be good enhancements in general and um, <laughs> so Louisa if you want it now I'm sure we could provide patches but then it would be up to you or your developers to um, apply them to whatever instance of Sakai you're using and make them work. Uh, Sharon says, very good for our clinical instructors teaching small groups. Pictures are great. They can be printed out. Yeah. I think it would be optional to turn off whether students see others' photos. Yes, that's entirely configurable, Terry, um, by your institution. Um, so we've made our decisions. And um, Matthew, I'm not sure. Is that all uh, determined by properties? So the um, the business rules around who can see photos and who cannot are not really part of these roster tool changes. They're things that we did elsewhere. And so um, that wouldn't be part of what would be contributed back necessarily out of this. And whatever, however Sakai by default handles photo permissions um, would be applicable to these um, new roster changes as well. Okay, so probably realm permissions would manage that in most cases. I think it's some stuff in mostly in the profile tool. Roster pulls its photos I think mostly from profile so I think that mm -hmm. um, there are uh, some controls available in profile. I'm not entirely sure since we've um, taken a pretty strict approach to this. Um, I'm not sure what the, yeah. the I think there, Sakai. It might be a combination of profile and roster um, realm permissions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, anything else? So it, I'm delighted that you guys are interested in these. Uh, we, we thought they were pretty great, and our faculty, we have not received any more complaints. <laughs> Drag and drop would be cool to conform with a classroom layout. Oh, uh, wouldn't it? That's a, that's a really great idea. So, you know, perhaps down the road, Sean, I really like that idea. So, yeah, we're on 11-2 right now, and um, uh, so... What we'll do is if we if we find that we our funds don't go far enough to contribute all of this back, um, then what we would do is make a farm project in that case and um, allow other institutions to help fund what whatever you know gap is left for getting the um, enhancements in. I'm glad you all are excited about this. Any other questions? 30 seconds. So I'm, you know, I think I'm done unless you guys have other questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks to Matthew um, for, for doing all of this. It's, it's a really nice enhancement. Cool. Right, well, thank I, you, Tricia. You're oh, welcome. I don't have a link to the presentation. But um, I can 
upload it and then send you a link. All right. All right. So thank you. Thank you again. And thank you to all our presenters today. Um, I guess to end to end this, um, I want to thank everyone who participated and asked questions as well. Uh, that makes it for a lively session. And um, I guess the biscuit has risen. We've got it uh, <laughs> fully baked, and uh, it's time time to end. So thank you everyone for coming, and uh, we will upload this. There will be this has has been recorded, and it will get uploaded to YouTube. We have a Lightning Talks channel. This is our third Lightning Talks for Aperio. And um, the other two are published there already as well. So we'll see you next time, and, and thanks a lot. Bye. And Sun, Sun Yun, I'll um, add a slide with the hide name view so you can see what that looks like when I send out a, a link to that. Thanks, okay, Neil. I see a request. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks. If anyone has any requests, please send me an email directly. Thank you. Bye.